Okay, so we've got a bit of a change in camera angle because I was asked on Patreon to do an examination of what was on my bookshelves, these particular bookshelves, which I actually thought would be really fun. So this is my reading nook. Like, I'm really sorry, that's really, really lame, but that's actually what I call it. It's the alcove under the stairs. It's got my armchair where I film and my ottoman that me and my daughter made out of a coffee table, a duvet, some cushions, and this fabric, which was a pair of curtains. Um, and then this is the books that I'm working with at any particular period in time. Now I have a whole bunch of bigger shelves over there with kind of a whole bunch of books that maybe I'm not using, reference books, economics, politics, um, philosophy. And then I have another shelf on top of the fireplace, which is fiction. But this is the books that I'm using at any period in time and I kind of tend to gather them all together and get them on these shelves so that I know what I'm grabbing for and I can just work without being interrupted. So we'll get on with it. This is the book that I'm working with at the minute. It's Empires of the Silk Roads. And this book is actually really, really excellent. It's by a guy called Christopher Beckworth. And what he has done is um, a history of all the different peoples of the Eurasian steppe. He's taken the linguistic evidence, the archeological evidence, um, the literary sources, and it's actually really well done and really structured. This one is the one that everybody's bought, which is Empire, which is the Silk Roads, which is terrible. And it's just an Oxford academic going, oh, look, this is like a really foreign place that we don't know anything about. These countries know their own history. This guy is actually really, really solid. This guy is called Christopher Beckworth and is very much worth reading. This is a woman called Gerda Lerner. It's the creation of patriarchy. And what I didn't realize when I thought I was being super clever with all that analysis of ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt and belief systems and the role of women was that this woman had done very similar in the 70s and 80s and been completely ignored because she was a woman. So there's that. Right. This is Mysteries of the Snake Goddess. This is a, 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 like an investigation into the forging of artifacts, particularly around the Minoan civilization. So a lot of their artifacts are incredible. The seals are incredible. But you have to be careful with the frescoes and the figurines. And it's actually a look at how terrible archaeology can actually do a lot of harm and why you have to be very, very careful with sources. This is my copy of Plato's Republic. Me and Plato, we do not get on. If you want to read about Socrates, read Xenophon, who also came up with the term Thucydides trap. It's much more reliable. I think Plato was making it up about Socrates, I'm going to be honest. But what he did do, in my opinion, is condense an earlier learning system for a new audience at the roots of Greek civilization. So he has value. That's Plato's Republic, but I don't get on with Plato at all. Now, this is a book by a Western academic called Barnaby Rogerson, and I've got another one by him here the, about the Crusades. He's very good on Islamic history. His research skills are second to none, and he writes like a novelist. His books are really fun to read. Okay, so here we have two books on Al-Kindi, who was an Islamic philosopher at the core of the translation movement, which is like the intellectual backbone of the Islamic empire and the lights coming on to the world. So the birth of modern science, modern mathematics, modern philosophy. He's at the core of the translation movement and the recovery of classical knowledge. And he's really, really important. This book is a very, it's called Al-Kindi, the philosopher of the Arabs is really terrible and is a lesson in reading reviews and checking out a book before you fork out 25 quid for it. This one is by an English academic called Peter Adamson and it's got coffee rings on it. I'm really sorry, but it's actually excellent. And you can watch Peter Adamson lectures on Google and he's really interesting. Um, this is by an Islamic scholar called Fatima Manessi. And it's Shezerado Goes West, and it's an analysis of the harem structures. Fatima Manessi, as a scholar and historian, there is nothing that I have said about the Quran and Islamic history and the role of women that she has not said first and said better. There are about four books of hers that I want that I don't have yet, but this is really excellent. Right, what do we have? In terms of the same period in British history, I have Bede's The Ecclesiastical History of the English People. This, along with a guy called Alcuin, are incredible sources on the 7th and 8th century of English history. This is the starting point for British history. And it's very much a, a lesson in the scarcity of information that these had 
and also it's where our identity comes from we like British historians were referring back to Bede for hundreds and hundreds of years and he was actually a very clever man and also Alcuin who was based at Linda's farm but when you compare them to Al-Kindi you realize the sophistication of the Islamic Empire at that period and where we were is very 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 different this is apples and oranges and not tribalism okay so more history we've got the best historian I've got is a woman called Pauline Stafford. This is an analysis of queenship in the 11th century, Emma and Edith. I'm obsessed with Emma of Normandy. And this is Unification and Conquest, which is about the formation of the England that kind of emerges from the Battle of Hastings. There is not a single historian that has ever been on the 10th and 11th century in this country better than this woman. And she's spectacular on women and power. I've got another one by Robert Bartlett, who's a great historian. He's got loads of really good documentaries on the BBC about the Normans, the Vikings, but he can't see women at all. Now, this is a book by Michael Wood, who's a BBC historian about the Dark Age, and it's called In Search of the Dark Ages. I think he had a TV series along with it. It's just beautifully done, and if you don't know that about the period, it's a really easy to read book. You're going to notice that there's pieces torn out of the covers of these books, and you're going to go, oh my god, what is this? When I was 17, I used to buy secondhand books and take them back to the bookshop if I needed money for gas or electric, or milk or whatever. And I developed this habit of tearing pieces out of the cover of the books that I wanted to keep, which is just a terrible habit, but which has lasted into adulthood. Okay, politics. We have the biographies of Margaret Thatcher and Dennis Healy, which when read back to back will give you a solid understanding of the development of post-war British Westminster politics, which cannot be beaten. Dennis Healy in particular is a gifted writer, but you have to be careful and not buy one of his miscellaneous. I love that one because it's got a poem about Todmorden in it, and he actually, his auntie was from Unity Street, which is just around the corner from me. Right, this is another book. This is literally about 15 years old. It's torn to pieces, but it's Nicholas Timmins' biography of the welfare state. This is the most well-researched history, the political biography of the welfare state in this country you will ever read. It is my Bible. And he's really, really, really good. He recently revised it, and I have a digital edition, but not a paper edition. But it is a political biography, and what you also need to contextualise it is things like this, which is Management in Social Work, which is written by Audrey Melinda and um, Veronica Coolshed, which is actually a Bible that most social workers will have owned, which tells you about the development of systems that politicians couldn't see and how we manage them. Um, these two, this is Micromotives and Macro Behaviour, An Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin. These are two books that will give you the dynamics that you need to understand to understand how economic systems develop. Hayek very much was influenced by this and not his peers at the Chicago School. And, you know, this is really, really important stuff. Origin of the Species is excellent and really readable. Now, this is a biography of John Maynard Keynes by Hyman Minsky, but this is actually more a re-clarification. It tells you why Keynes's thoughts were reabsorbed into the neoclassical economics he tried to kill. And his thoughts on instability in stabilizing an unstable economy are really important now. But pro tips, do not go to the LSE and submit a thesis which vindicates both Minsky and Hayek because they won't like it at all. So, this is a copy of Economic Consequence of the Peace by John Maynard Keynes, and this is page one in Modern Economics. It was written in the Treaty, about the treaty of Versailles, saying that the power dynamics at play here would lead to the problems that caused World War II. That's a really important book. And this book, The Road from Serfdom, comes from Robert Skidelsky, who also wrote the only other biography of Keynes worth reading. And it's an analysis of what led to the end of communism. And what I realized when I read this book was that we had recreated all of these things, but while trying to do the opposite because of the narcissistic structure that we'd imbued in our economics by having it as a media focused thing. This is The Great Debate by an American conservative called Yuval Levin, and it's an analysis of the debate between Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine, who was, I think, the bit of the Owen Jones of his day in an English context, but useful in America. 
And basically, Edmund Burke was like the first conservative, like that's what they call him. And he was living in a period where the French Revolution was happening, the American Revolution, and he's writing very much about what's keeping England stable. He's writing in the period of George III. He's incredibly perceptive as a writer, and more Tories that describe themselves as Burkean conservatives should read him. But he's the reason that I know that Joe Biden and Boris Johnson are intellectually and politically kind of philosophically aligned, because actually intersectionality is um, and the evolution of the rule of law is kind of what Burke was alluding to. So it's actually worth knowing that. Now, this is the Book of Changes, which is the book that's actually become, it's one of the earlier texts that became the I Ching. This is really interesting because it's like the earliest example of the symbolic writing that later on becomes the parable writing of both Mesopotamian literature, the Bible and the Quran, and it shows you a continuation back to China from these texts. So that's really useful. This is a book by a really great woman called Jane Lewis, who is an academic who looks at lone motherhood and policy narratives around lone motherhood in Britain. And it's also by Kathleen Kiernan. And this book actually saved my thesis. Right now, this book I love more than anything. And it's an actual copy of the piece of political propaganda that Emma of Normandy, Edward the Confessor's mother, had written to besmirch a Gilfu of Northampton's children. And this is kind of, she's the aunt of William the Conqueror. This is actually a really important book and I couldn't have it for ages because it was so expensive. It was £30, but I got it and I literally, sometimes I just hug it. I actually just love it. I have um, a duplicate of Emma and the Vikings by Harriet O'Brien, which is a readable history of Emma of Normandy. What else we've got? We've got The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, which I've never actually read, but was given to me as a present, and I keep because I like the title and the cover. I have a book by Salman Rushdie on my bookshelves, even though I don't like Salman Rushdie as a writer, because I think what was done to him was pretty shocking. Now, what else have we got here? We have got... This is an overview of a hundred philosophers and by a guy called Peter King. And it's really great because it's actually a global overview. It includes Indian philosophers, Chinese philosophers, Greek philosophers. I use a lot of these because you can't know everything. And sometimes it's useful to have had somebody do a praise of somebody's work who you haven't encountered. And I actually use this a lot. I have another one here, which is a history of thought, of economic thought, which does the same. It's different schools of economists throughout history. And when I'm not familiar with something, I use these, which I don't think is cheating because I follow it up with doing the reading. I've got a special mention for my, one of my favorite novels. This is Harper Lee's Go Set a Watchman. It's the book, like, To Kill a Mockingbird is written through the squinting eyes of a child idealising their father, but this is a grown-up understanding of the relationship between identity and oppression from the perspective of a white person. It's an astonishingly simple book. It didn't get the recognition it was due, but in about 50 years, this will be recognised as one of the greatest books that's been written in the last 100 years. This is a book by Anthony Atkinson, who was the academic supervisor of Thomas Piketty about what economics cannot see. It's called Inequality and what can be done what can be done. Anthony Atkinson actually passed away a couple of years ago and he's why my expectations of the LSE were that they were looking to change and what I found when I got there was they weren't. I'm trying to think what else is there. Oh this is actually um this guy is a real clown. His name is Niall Ferguson and he's become a real tabloid caricature and he's actually really obnoxious and he's fallen in love with his own ego. And most of his books are actually devastatingly offensive. But this one is The Ascent of Money, A Financial History of the World. And it's a very useful one to give you the roots of things like hedge funds and the economic systems and financial systems we've got now. He's a conservative and has to be taken with a pinch of salt but I try to make sure that I read from across the spectrum. And there's a couple here. There's this one, which is, I keep this. This is a, a biography by Ibn Ishaq of the Prophet Muhammad, and it's the best-selling version of it, but it's actually useless. And I use an online translation, and I spent money on this, and it's useless, and it's a book that teaches me that translation matters. The translation I use online has much more information in it than this one, and these are not the same book. 
So this is the most popular Ibn Ishaq translation of the Prophet, the life of the Prophet Muhammad, but it's almost useless. And finally, this is the Lysistrata, which is the funniest play you will ever, ever read. And it's about women in Greece withholding sex to get their menfolk to stop going to war. It's hilarious. But it's also really interesting in the dynamics and the political, because it was a very misogynistic power structure in ancient Greece. And it's actually really, really interesting for that. So I'm going to cut this video here. I could go on for much, much longer, but that is basically a tour of my bookshelf, my bookshelves. I will literally put the titles of all these books underneath so that you can get them. Please don't message me about how offended you are by me tearing the little pieces out of the covers. I'm very, very sorry. And I'm very sorry if you're an alphabet nut and can't understand how I function without actually um oh wait two more three more sorry wait we've got Karl Marx biography by Francis Wien if Karl Marx had done the housework and looked after his children he would have understood the means of production and I think Francis Wien agrees with me I kind of know Francis and he's a lovely man this is Chris Wickham the on European history from about 400 to a thousand looking from the end of Rome to the birth of the Europe that we know He's really good because he understands that you have to have a multi-dimensional model. It's not a flat map, it's a hierarchy. He understands money and power. I would recommend this writer. And this is The Slow Death of British Industry by Nicholas Comfort. And this is um, a lesson in not lending me a book because this is, again, my friend Mark lent me this. It's an analysis of the changes in British industry from 1952 to 2012 and I need to give it in back at some point. So I'm gonna leave that there because I could really go on forever. That is a tour of my bookshelves. I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I'm still crowdfunding the 350 pound for research materials and equipment, PayPal's underneath. You can talk to me through Patreon, which I'm learning to really, really like. That's why I did this video. Um, I will be back on Sunday with the history of ancient Mesopotamia as part of my analysis of the silk, what we mistakenly call the Silk Roads. So that's that.